afternoon and welcome to all the speakers, chairs and the wonderful audiences to this ACNS webinar. We are back again with two wonderful education lectures for you. The speaker for the first session of today is our honored guest from Ankara, Turkey, Professor Yusuf Shukru Chalar. Professor Chahlar is the chairman and professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Ankara University School of Medicine, Turkey. He was the past president of the Turkish Neurosurgery Society, and he's also the founding member of the Turkish Spinal Surgery Group. His clinical interests are focused on skull base and spinal surgery. He has won several awards and honors for his innovations and contribution to neurosurgery in his country. He has been an invited faculty to various conferences and workshops in various parts of the world, and he's also an noted author with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar and to Today he'll be talking about surgical management of lower clival and anterior foramen magnum lesions. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from China, Professor Yong Hong Wang. He is a master's supervisor at the Shangxi Bethune Hospital, Shangxi Academy of Medical Sciences. He is also the deputy director and director of Neurological Trauma Award. He was a past visiting scholar in the United States and Europe. He is the president of the Trauma Surgeons Branch of the Shangxi Medical Association and member of Neurotrauma Committee of National Trauma Medical Center. We are extremely honored to have him today with us, and he'll be talking about the mechanism of cystinostomy. The chair for the first session of today is our honored guest from Tokyo, Professor Akihide Kondo. Professor Kondo is the chairman and professor of the Department of Neurosurgery at the prestigious Juntendo University, Tokyo, Japan. Professor Kondo is an expert in the management of brain tumors and is a very prominent figure in the Japanese Neurosurgical Society. His research interests are focused upon skull-based surgery, and he has published several manuscripts in various internationally peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the first session of today's webinar. The chair for the second session of today is our honored guest from Nepal, Professor Amit Thapa. Professor Thapa is the director of the Advanced Neurosciences Center and the head of Department of Neurological Surgery at the Kathmandu Medical College Teaching Hospital, Sinamangal, Kathmandu, Nepal. He is the vice president of the Nepali Society of Neurosurgeons. He is also the chairperson of the Neurospine chapter of the NASON. He is a renowned author with several publications in various international journals. He is also on the editorial board of several prestigious journals like Journal of Peripheral Nerve Surgery, Annals of Neurological Surgery, and the Stroke. We are extremely honored to have him today to chair the session of Professor Yong Hong Wan. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kaito, I would like to welcome all the chair speakers and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to all our colleagues in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today, and with that introduction, I would like to hand over this podium to our first chair, Professor Akihide Kondo. Hi, everybody. It's uh, great my honor to introduce the Professor Chao Lansu. And the Professor Chao is uh, like a leader of the Ankara University Turkey. And uh, uh, you may know that uh, he has contributed to the development of the new surgery in every field, especially about the, the spinal surgery and the skull base surgery. And almost here, uh, I'm not impossible to introduce all of his achievements. So, but uh, uh, what I can say here for sure is that uh, he is continuing to publishing the paper and asking for that the clinical surgery and also contributing to the further development of the new surgery in the whole over the world. I'm really looking forward to today's his lecture and uh, which is sure to be based on that his expensive, expensive, expensive experiments of the, the surgery. Now, Professor Chalan, sir, please start your lecture. Thank you very much for these nice words. And I'm really excited and it's my honor to be here. And I would like to express my great appreciation to all the, our Asian colleagues and especially for Professor Koto and from your nice words from Professor Kondo. Uh, I hope we'll in the future meet face to face and discuss many things better. Now, today I briefly would like to ex uh, present my experience and my philosophy uh, to the surgical management of lower clival and anterior foramen magnum lesions. This is a part of the body of all neurosurgeons found it, I think, challenging. This surgery really challenging. The, Anatomical parts of this region is the lower clivus, actually, is C1 odontoid process and foramen magnum. We call all this part as craniovertebral junction. This junction actually uh, has many different lesions, and these lesions may come from the clivus. 
As we all know, clivus means it's like a hill. And the part of the clivus can be different for different lesions. It's a, a, if we divide it, it's a division that we need for surgical approaches, not an anatomical division, but we can call uh, the part of the clivus above the abducens and trigeminal nerve as the upper clivus. The part between the fifth and ninth cranial nerves can be called as middle clivus. And from the ninth cranial nerve to the foramen magnum, we, call, we can call this part as the lower clivus. And I will give a special attention to that part. Most common lesions of this part is, as we all know it, chordoma. Sometimes chordomas can be a really tough case for us. And uh, I will show some cases which we deal with difficulty sometimes. Chondrosarcomas, meningiomas, osteoblastomas, metastatic tumors can be found here. And some type of cysts like dermoid or epidermoid cysts can also be seen here. And in my country, we also see some diseases like cystidatic. Foramen magnum is also a special part of the skull. And the, as we all know that it is a special shape, oval shape, and it's getting wider posteriorly. Anterior is narrow. The anterior part is more narrow. And the, here below this part, we see the odontoid process. If we look all of this region together, I mean, to the craniovertical cervical junction, there are maybe two different types of disorders. One of them, we can call it development or congenital, like platybasia, basilar imagination, condylar dysplasia. And we see many bony segmental anomalies in this part of the, both the skull and the vertebra. We also now, they see more and more acquired disorders and like many tumors, metastatic or primary tumors can be detected here. And we see in my country also many trauma cases, axial instabilities, some specific infections like tuberculosis and specific type of syndrome, which causes, again, this location we call Grisel syndrome following the retropharyngeal infections. We, the symptomology of this part, uh, due to lesions can be as, uh, various, but they are not very typical. Head and neck pain, numbness, tingling, loss of strength, restriction in neck movements, and rarely we see dysarthria, dysphagia, sometimes even syncope. Surgical approaches, classically can be divided, both for, for a magnum and clivus as anterior, posterior, lateral or posterior lateral, or I will discuss in detail later, far condylar, I will mention MFT's terminology usually calls it condylar, transcondylar. And nowadays we are more coming familiar with the minimal invasive endoscopic approaches. Even we have a limited experience, if I have time, I will show you with the robotics, Da Vinci robotics for this region for the transoral excision of the tumors. So, which approach to which lesion? I think it depends on the location and the extent of the lesion. And size, size and the nature of the pathology also uh, gives us some pitfalls for the approach. Classically, when we are, we are dealing with skull base in the past days, huge craniotomies or prefrontal transposal approaches I know Professor Sami likes this approach very much. And uh, we also experienced with our ENT colleagues, transoral, transpalatal, transpatial approaches, left fourth osteotomies. These are more suitable for the lesions that extend extradurally and goes even to the sphenoid sinuses or other parts of the maxillofacial area. Posterior lateral approaches also we tried a lot. I think you are all familiar with these approaches. 
subtemporal sub suboxical presigmoid, posterior petrosectomy, and Japanese people have a great, great uh, advance in these approaches, retrosigmoid, extreme translateral transcondylar approaches. These approaches are more uh, for the regions that located medial and lower clivus. And if the petros bona had been invaded or uh, involved in with these lesions, you can try this type of approaches. The frontotemporal transalvin approach, Yashar, you also call it pterion approach, can be used also for the clivus, but it needs a great experience. And sometimes you have to go uh, to drill out the um, posterior conoid, and even you can go transcavernous. Subtemporal transcavernous approach is also has many difficulties, and I don't think nowadays it's going to be more popular because of the approaches that we've switched to now, like minimalism approaches or endoscopic. In the past days, our mentor Crockard, we all know him, popularized the transoral transpiratory approach. We, I had a few experience and first of all, you cannot uh, try this approach in some cases like with a large trunk, if the patient has a large trunk. And the uh, postoperative period was really sometimes very painful for the patients. They have to go with tracheotomy, they have to go feed, have feeding tubes, and uh, they can experience velopharyngeal insufficiency. So with this approach, the retractors are still, I have been keeping, but it may be sometimes very, very painful for the patients in the post-supportive period. We have a good collaboration with our ENT colleagues. And when the first endoscopic uh, surgeries have been coming in, in our department, we tried first the biopsies, and now the new technology, of course, we all know, has given us the chance to even more, do more expensive surgeries using the endoscopes. And now there are 3D endoscopes, many different facilities, and we are now really happy with this approach. Median spokesman approach, we all our, uh, during the residency have been tried, and sometimes it may help. We have to know the anatomy well. But the, my favorite approach for this region is the paramedian spokesman approach. LMFT inspires a lot, of course, and he call it transcondylar approach. I will discuss the details later. And uh, I usually prefer a hockey stick incision, which begins in the month from the master tip. I don't know if you can see the cursor. Then it goes up to the nickel line, and in the midline, it goes down to the C1 and C2 level. We, they also call it far lateral approach. We prefer mostly part bench position. Some of my colleagues try it in the semi sting position, but I am not so happy with that position. Dissection of the posterior lateral muscles are very important. The, mo the most important anatomical figure here is the vertebral artery. You have to be very familiar how to expose it. Then you have to perform spokesman craniotomy, and you can remove the C1. Sometimes occipital condyle or a part of the occipital condyle. Sometimes the jugular tubercle is more important. It's going to be on your way. In the literature, you may see many different terminology, but more or less, I think in our practice, they are they go to, to the same though. Muscle dissection is very important. Briefly, I want everything to be simple. So briefly, the first layer after the skin flap is going to be the muscle layer. And you have to identify the lateral muscle group, which is the sternocleate muscle and the semi capitis. You can both take them for, um, as a flap to the anterior part, you have to leave a five centimeters of calf or to, to re-stitch it up when you are trying to close it. The same on the medial side is the trapezius and semi muscles. You can 
remove, you can use as a muscle flap later on if you need them. There are many triangles in the literature. It's not easy in the real surgery to identify them. What you have to be careful about is the uh, superior medial and triangle. There is a venous and the inferior triangle. There are some venous plexus. And again, Mefti calls them as the type of plexus, which can be also called like a cavernous sinus. It's attached to the vertebra, around the vertebral artery, usually. You have to also recognize and identify C1 root, adnatoxyl joint, and C posterior ar arcus. After that, you, the spokes were correct me, has to be performed. C1 art can be removed with drill or kerosene. Vertebral artery can be mobilized or can you can also always not need to mobilize it. You can keep it in its position, but you have to be careful about the fibroadipose cuff around it and some venous plexus. And sometimes there are branches going into the uh, dura. With, with the most common branch is the posterior meningeal artery. Condyls, usually I don't nowadays reject the condyls. Sometimes maybe one third posterior, and it's sometimes the shape or the uh, size of the condyl if it's on your way when you're trying to reach the lesion. You have to go the row incision medial of the sigmoid sinus and posterior to the vertebral artery. Again, you have to be careful about the hemorrhages here that I have mentioned before, marginal sinus and posterior meningeal artery. What I want to show you here is the jugular tubercle. Jugular tubercle may be on your way in some cases, and it's more important to identify and sometimes to drill it, much, much more important than the occipital condom. It depends on the type of the lesions. I'll show you an it's a case which is a lady, 28 years old, after trauma, incident from a magnum meningioma was found in the MR scan. And we used the parlateral transcondylar approach in this case. And I will show you the videos. And you see before that CT angio shows me the vertebral artery. I, I have to be careful about it, it may be dominant on this side, this is the right side. Park bench position, we use neuromonitoring. You see the muscle and the bony structures, you have to be keeping in mind, this is the muscle flap of face incision muscle band. And this is the C1. And the, this is the, you know, when I'm trying to the, dissect the muscles, you see the bleedings coming from the marginal sinus or the, when it's flexes around the vertebral artery. So this is an alarming sign. You have to be careful about the vertebral artery. And I think this is an artery that can be a branch or it, it may be a posterior, going to the posterior dura, that's posterior meaning the artery, maybe. You see, this is a case where step by step, we have to be careful about the bleeding. And this bleeding is an alarm that the vertebral artery is around. You, I'm using Doppler, so Doppler uh, make me sure that the, the still I am how much I am far away from the vertebral artery. This is the occipital one. This is the C1 arc, and the, the navigation probe. Of course, navigation also helps us a lot, and the navigation is good in skull base, better than the brain parenchyma. Of course, we all know that. The ring of the occipital bone and the kerosene also helps. I don't need to remove a big part of the occipital bone. Now I am coming to drilling the foramen magnum region, and I have to be careful about the jugular tubercle and jugular bulb, of course. And the condyle still is away. I am not touching it. I am trying to go. You know, the vertebral artery. The, you see, it goes down into the 
skull here, and you have to be very careful about the venous plexus or the marginal sinus around it. And the first, when dissecting, you have to, with your finger, feel the tubercle of the C1 and C2, where the foramen goes and where the vertebral foramen goes inside this foramen. You have to feel it with your finger before the dissecting. That's also important. Navigation probe, jugular buff is there. I, I don't want to go, go much more there for the sephoromagrum meningioma. C1 hemonectomy has been almost finished. And the vertebral artery is there. I am trying to keep it in a fibroadipose cuff. I don't need to deskeletize the vertebral artery. If I am not trying to uh, move it some, it is not on my way. After opening the dura, the arachnoid layer is here. I should be careful about the nervous C1, C2. Sometimes the rootlets of spinal accessory nerve may be on my way. As you see the intradural part of the vertebral artery here and the neural attachments, sometimes the uh, ligaments can be there and you, you can cut them to other ligaments or to other ligaments. And now uh, I am going to debulk it. And now neuromonitoring helps me. I'm trying to check how far I am away from the motor nerve roots. Dissecting it, and it, I was lucky in this case because there was a good plane, arachnoid plane, with the brainstem and the meningioma. I am trying to first coagulate, shrink, and I am going to. I am using the chuser to debulk it. After debulking it, you know, see it's easier to move and take the tumor. You have to be very patient. Usually this type of meningiomas, I mean the location, in this location, we don't see many, uh, many meningiomas and do not bleed too much. Most of them is easy to debunk and, and if you are careful and you can also Coagulate the feeders from the dura. It's the, at the beginning of the surgery. It helps a lot for you to remove the tumor without any bleeding. You see, I'm trying to detach from the dura. Uh, it's now the tumor can be mobilized, as I have mentioned before. There isn't much uh, the, it can be easily detached from the arachnoid. So there's a good arachnoid plane between the brainstem and the tumor. It's, uh, you see the cranial nerves, it's the soft nerve. I'm going to again open a window and to use CUSA. Again, trying to identify the motor nerve roots. And there are usually radical arteries or the veins which go just behind the nerve roots. You can sacrifice this nerve root as we all know. But you have to be very careful about the spinal accessory nerve. And if the spinal accessory nerve sometimes have variations and you, with the prop, if you, detect that it goes to the shoulder or deltoid muscle, so it can maybe uh, cause the weakness in the shoulder for support. So the patients are not going to be happy with that. I have one case like that, so still the patient is uh, complaining about her shoulder. And uh, I piece by piece, my beam, I'm trying to take out the tumor. And again, always trying to uh, be sure that it's not 
going or attached to the other vital structures. You see there's a feeder, arterial feeder here. And I coagulate it, I cut it. You have to be patient. It can be easily mobilized, but do not take it out uh, without being sure that every vital structure has been detached from the tumor. So this is the part that I am trying to be sure that the cranial root nerves and there may be some ascending or descending and spinal axis to the branches. It's not easily, you can always uh, be sure with the neuromonitoring in these cases. Then top ligaments can be sometimes misdiagnosed as the nerve roots. You can easily be attached to the then top ligaments, cut them. Again, be patient. Sometimes you have to be careful about your instincts. If you are not sure that the tumor is still uh, very mobile, be patient. Try to be in such a dialogue. Are you going to come out or are you still going to be there? Uh, it's a type of dialogue between you and the tumor. Are you free to come or should I wait more? And again, you see the other side of the arachnoid and the for my Martin. Again, please, my meal. It makes it easier to take out the tumor. Of course, neuromonitoring is vital. Uh, I have to say there were very bad experiences in the past. CUSA is very important. A good micro dissection technique is, of course, must. You have to be trained well. And uh, we have one case like which we ruptured iatrogenic with the vertebral artery. So you have to also in your hand the clips, temporary clips in case if you injure the vertebral artery yet to be able to put stitches or sometimes even maybe anastomosis but uh, it's not always easy to take the patient to angiography unit uh, especially in cases like this you see the tumor is not very willing to come still and now i convinced the tumor to come out but still there's only some attachments do not uh, force the tumor sometimes sharp dissection is much much more easy and much, much more safe. Here it is, yes. Now, and then you, the dura should be closed very tightly. Uh, there can be CSF leakage or CSF, maybe real problem. And we put some glue, fibrin glue also, to be sure that the tumor, the, there is no leak in the dura and the postoperative MR scan. In the postoperative, you see the condyle is almost not touched, the vertebral artery is still patent. And this is a, one of the cases. And uh, this is another case which is has a right hemiparesis and it's a huge meningioma. And you see that almost the arteries are inside the tumor. So in this tumor, I prefer to approach from the left side because right side is always uh, uh, already has been affected 
And I was uh, a little bit cautious about giving more trouble to the uh, pyramidal tract on the right side, since she has the right hemiparal side, right left side. And in this case, I was also a little bit more uh, cautious, and I prefer a large craniectomy and large bone opening. And so it makes me feel better if we, I am trying to deattach the tumor. And I am, I am, I feel more confident when I, under my hand, I see the brain stem and the cerebellum open white. And if I see them, I can preserve them. I can keep them safe during the surgery better. That's my feeling. You see the huge tumor here. Yes, yes. And the uh, arachnoid, CSF. Sometimes if you keep the arachnoid intact, you can close it, but I don't think it's so uh, essential in cases like this. Fusa again, and then uh, you see the tumor is more, uh, has a more soft tissue sometimes, and so it's easy to suck it out with or without scusa. But it can be more vascular. But still, these tumors can be more easy to take out because they replace or they can uh, push away the neural roots, vertebral artery away. In the same philosophy, sometimes peace my peace. You bulk it, be patient. It's a type of dialogue. Are you ready to come out? Of course, I'm not so quick. This is a quick edition of the surgery. And you see, even large tumors can be removed with this procedure. And again, the post-operative we put some tea, fat or fascia sometimes to close the uh, neural opening. And um, this is again the parietal. This is a different case. You see, this is case. This the tumor is located in the middle and lower clivus. It's a clivus tumor. And if the old days, I think we will have to discuss how should we remove the tumor. It's just behind, uh, next to the apex of the petrose bone. But nowadays, thanks to God, there is endoscopy. And I was also a little bit cautious about using the endoscopy in this case, because still, I don't have much experience. My colleagues are more experienced than me. We need sometimes take help from the ENT guys, and they open the first uh, uh, go down to the clivus, and they keep a flap to close it. So this is really helps a lot to close the wound and avoid CSF leakage. They call it at that flap. Now they we came to just next to the. Spinal sinus and with neuronavigation, navigation, you see, we are now going to the clivus. And you see, after the tumor has already showed itself underneath the bone, cortical bone, it's just below the spinal sinus, middle part of the clivus, and lower clivus. It extends to there. We drill out the clivus, and in these cases, clivus is not so strong, not so difficult to drill out. We are using diamond drill. And now I am using this uh, pituitary thread to remove the meningioma, the bulk it. And you see the, the tissue in the this type of tumors that's located here is different. More 
bleeding and uh, more vascular, but softer. This is a different type of tissue in the meningioma. And of course, this is sometimes uh, can be a nightmare if you are not sure that the tumor is not, do not attach to the brain stem or vertebral or basilar artery. You see brain stem, I am feeling it and with, I know that the, it's a feeling uh, that it's not stick to the this structure. So you have to be very careful, of course, and you have to be very patient. It takes hours to remove with is my piece. And again, uh, navigation also is very good here because this bony structure navigation do not uh, use, do not uh, use poke results. After when closing, we use also flaps and the uh, muscle and sometimes adipose tissue. So the tumor like this can be easily removed. This is the post-operative, even if it's in the old days, we were trying to use many skull-based approaches, which are very, very difficult to open. Again, sometimes they have to take all day. Now, it's, this is another case, which is only a, uh, like a basilar imagination. It's also a good case to remove it with the uh, endoscopy. And nowadays, uh, we can use also augmented reality for planning the surgery. It's uh, in my office, you see it, my residence, I'm trying to uh, make a plan how we can approach the tumor in this region. This is the laterally located. Region. I couldn't edit the surgery of this case, but I will show you later. It was a good case for bilateral approach, but what we need in this type of techniques helps us. Sometimes you can be, you cannot be sure where, where is the brainstem, like the case I showed you before, where is the vertebral artery? And you can take these images in the, inside the OR. It's just checking, it's just planning. You cannot do surgery with this, of course. And uh, I think uh, I posted a letter that transcended a little and the lateral approach is quite satisfactory in many cases. You have to be sure that if you know the anatomy well and if you study the neuroimaging techniques for the surgery, you can easily preserve the neurovascular structures. There can be modifications of this surgery. What I should briefly say, finally, these are tools, they are new tools. But our goal is, I think, the augmented safety for the patients. And still, our golden technique is microsurgery. And thanks to Professor Yashagi. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to show my cases. Thank you very much, Professor Chalansu, and uh, uh, as presentation for us, too. So I think that he uh, showed that he's like a uh, summary of the surgical approaches first. And uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, pretty much uh, anatomical educative, and also we could understanding that uh, what his concept to the approach to the lower clivus and uh, cranial cervical junction. And next, his presentation is uh, uh, actual cases, including the foramenomegaloid meningioma and also like uh, degeneration. And lastly, that uh, he showed us that uh, some kind of like a cutting edge uh, technology things. And uh, for the surgical like uh, planning, and uh, uh, we all feel that the most important things to to get into the uh, operating room, we have to have that uh, concrete idea to to do that. What we can do for the for the patient. So it's pretty much a wonderful presentation for us too. So then uh, I'm, uh, I'm I'm going to ask that the Professor Charles to, to take that some like question from the audience. Uh, please uh, give. Please give us sir, some time for that. So, yeah, there are no far. There are no questions in the Q and A session so far. We can of course take comments from Professor Amit Thapa as well. Professor Thapa, any comments from your side? 
Yeah, first of all, let me congratulate uh, Professor Sukru for a very masterly demonstration uh, of the procedure. Um, well, um, I have, uh, you have almost covered literally everything about this approach. Uh, just a few um, uh, suggestions from your side. What all uh, techniques do you use to localize the vertebral artery? Uh, I think preoperative CT angiography is essential. Yeah. And during the surgery, your finger. You have, while dissecting, you have to feel the tubercle of the, you know, C2, where the foramen of vertebral foramen goes. And then there is also a groove. Sometimes this groove becomes a hole. You have to you also feel with your finger uh, the vertebral artery going from the, this tubercle of the C2 to the medially and anterior to C1. Then you may use the uh, Doppler and other things. ICG, I tried ICG, but uh, I think your finger, your, you have to be carefully uh, study the preoperative CT angiography. CT angiography is good because it shows you the bone and it shows you the groove and it shows you the vertebral artery. And then navigation may also help, of course. Thank you very much. Any comments from my course, Dr. Libun Singh? Uh, thanks, Raja. Thanks, Professor, for a very exciting uh, lecture, Professor. I just have two questions, Professor. Uh, regarding uh, a, a far lateral approach, uh, would you think that the, with the endoscopic approach, uh, we'll be able to uh, preserve a con condal better? Uh, secondly, in those who are with condala remover or partial remover, where you think the instability uh, will be a questioning, uh, what are the best uh, 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 instrumentation that in your hand that we, you would do? Thank you, Prof. Uh, I think endoscopy is becoming more and more effective way and safest way of visualizing these, these parts. And to remove the condyle, diamond drills are still the best but you, you have to be uh, very careful. And uh, I think the electrical motor high speed drills is much, much better than the pneumatic ones. And uh, of course, now mm, there are some special drills that you can use in the endoscope, but it needs some training because with your free hand, it's you can give some special angles, but through the endoscope, and uh, it needs some training. It needs a learning curve. I am not. Uh, I don't feel myself uh, very com confident in this type of drilling through the endoscope. To be true. Thank you very much. For those wonderful comments, Professor Chalar. We can go back to our chair, Professor Akide Kondo, to yes. hear his concluding remarks and any questions for the rest. Okay, so I have a couple of questions. And uh, question one is uh, you use the, the flow of the hemostat, the so called same, maybe flow seal or uh, some other type of the hemostat. I think that uh, we uh, we feel that there are low like uh, bleeding sources around the craniosacral junction. What is the best like uh, it's not it's just the instrument. What is the best like a hemostat steps uh, for or approaching these uh, lesions? Could you give me some idea for that? I so think bleeding, it, I mean. yeah, it's better not to bleed. The best way is you if you know the anatomy. And uh, I don't uh, like these hemostatic agents very much if we are going to open the dura. Sometimes it goes inside the dura and it may cause even uh, uh, some atypical complications. We experience that, especially in the brain. So uh, if you have time, it's better if it's a venous bleeding to put a piece of cotton and uh, some type of surgical jerfo and then wait. But all my residents and we all are more uh, uh, eager to use such type of chemical agents. 
Um, but they work well, and uh, you have to clean it them in the end. That's most yeah, yeah, important. Exactly that. You have don't. Uh, you have to be careful. You have to wash it, wash it, wash it. If you don't wash mm -hmm. it, it may cause even infection under the skin. I mean, so it's not uh, something very ideal. I think it's okay. uh, maybe used in very emergency cases or in the war surgery and such type of things. But uh, I am not happy that all my residents are getting used to use it more and more, and they are not going to forget to make a nostalgia with bipolar or with uh, old classical ways. So I, there are some complications, there are some side effects, and they have to use it properly. Mm -hmm. First, be patient, then put the cotton, wait, and then wash it, wash it, wash it. With water. <laughs> Okay, I do this. And the second, my question is like uh, uh, C1 laminectomies. And uh, uh, you mentioned something about that you don't have to like uh, remove or like mobilize the, the C1, uh, sorry, body blood RT. But in just cases that they, you still uh, remove the, the lam lamina for identification or like a good, good surgical field for the, for the, for the uh, intraday region. So what, what is the exact necessary for the, the C1 laminectomy? Could you give me an idea for that? I think it's, it's a limited laminectomy. If the vertebral artery is not on your way, sometimes you can look, uh, see from the uh, CT angio in the axial cuts, the vertebral artery may be coming more major than posteriorly. Then of course mm -hmm. you have to mm, uh, put a, at some time of ligature or some, you have to move it on your way. But uh, you don't, what I mean, these nurse, nurse surgeons sometimes like to show everybody how competent we are. And uh, it can, it, it's going to give you a half centimeters more uh, surgical field. You don't need to play with that artery much. It can be a narrower uh, field for uh, surgery, but to discretize and then move and uh, put the vertebral artery away is not necessary. It's only maybe sometimes a few millimeters of centimeters gives you more, but it's not, it doesn't uh, mean that you have to take that risk of causing complication. Sometimes you may even cause a stroke if, if some patients in my country, there are a lot of atherosclerotic patients. I, I, what I mean, you have to be more careful surgeon. Don't play with these arteries if it's not so essential. Just keep them away. I mean, they may be some dangerous. We have a case which we, we ruptured the vertebral artery and we put two clips and we were lucky we could stitch it and the vertebrae was patent, but it may be sometimes disaster. Professor Kappa? Um, well, definitely, I would conjure with the, the professor um, regarding the uh, methods of stopping the bleeding. Uh, one thing which we usually do in haste is pack the tumor cavity or to pack the operative site with a lot of cottonoids. Now, we have to be considerate that there are a lot of cranial nerves all around, and the, any cottonoid put over the cranial nerve can cause paresis in the post-operative period. So we have to use a small cotton pledget and try to only hit on the uh, vascular area with, uh, with, with a cotton tamponoid if in case we're trying to do that. But we try to always avoid uh, the cranial nerves from any side. And definitely when the professor was telling about the uh, vertebral artery uh, uh, minimal mobilization, I was just remembering uh, uh, one of the uh, quote, uh, we should not try to look for anatomy in the pathology specimens. So definitely we should not expose what is not required. Uh, try to be as minimal as possible in exposure and hit on the tumor directly as much as possible. Thank you. Very right. well said. Right. So yes, Professor Kondo, we can hear your concluding remarks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, that uh, what I'm sure here is like, uh, you know, uh, still like a uh, professor, uh, Sharon, so he's a, a great surgeon. 
And also, we, uh, we are not like a good surgeon for the cranial subject of junction since that it's like a complicated for anatomical things, but still, uh, his lecture is really helpful for, for the, our, like a to, uh, our clinical uh, trial for that. But still that there, you know, all the, the, this part of the lesion is like a challenging surgery. So that uh, we should understand that what he wanna say here in, in this lecture, and that we could uh, understand much more from, from his like uh, uh, publication or his lecture. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for about the, the Professor Chow answer. And we have really enjoyed that, uh, your lecture. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very, thank very much. Your, uh, thank you very much. Very, very, very good. Thank you very much, thank you. Well, thank you very much. It was indeed a very excellent session by Professor Shukru Chalar. And thank you very much, Professor Akhinder Kondo, for chairing this session. I would also like to inform our viewers that this webinar is being broadcasted on WeChat, Zoom, and YouTube. And currently, we have 1,134 people who have joined us live today for this webinar. So we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Now we'll move on to the second session and invite Professor Amit Thapa to say his introduction part. And we'll in turn invite Professor Yong Han Wang for his lecture. Professor Thapa, all yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raja, for this kind invitation. And uh, thank you, ACNS, for giving uh, this platform for discussion on a very important topic called cystinostomy or cystinal drainage. Well, the, this topic has been uh, covered in most of the platforms, but then it's always uh, very new to listen. Uh, other speakers also speak on them. Um, well, to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Yongzong Wang, the professor is well known for his uh, talk on basal system ostomy. Uh, he's from Sanzai Beitun Hospital, Sanzai Academy of Medical Sciences, uh, Taiwan University, China. Uh, without any further delay, let me invite uh, Professor Yong Hong Wang for his talk on mechanism of basal system nostomy. Professor, please share your slides, please. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to that this uh, uh, online seminar. My um, topic uh, is about uh, mechanism of basal system nostomy. Uh, I'm from China and uh, my hospital is uh, Shashi Basio Hospital. This is my content uh, at the uh, uh, basal cystostomy. <clears throat> Actually, basal cystostomy is an adequate technique for the treatment uh, uh, selected patients affected by diffuse uh, TBI, cerebral, uh, cerebral hemorrhage, uh, cerebr cerebral infunction, and uh, aneurysmal subacranoid hemorrhage. Uh, it is a proper alternative to DC with less cost and morbidity. Uh, since a single neurosurgical procedure is performed, uh, it should uh, be conducted for a better evalu evaluation. This technique is an uh, advanced in neurocritical surgery. Low cost morbidity and uh, low mortality are the major benefit of uh, cystosomy. Uh, based on uh, cystosomy, is a normal technique that uh, incorporates knowledge of school based and microvascular surgery. By opening the brain basal system to atmosphere pressure, the technique should decrease the intracranial pressure due to a uh, bank shift of the cerebral fluid from solo brain to the system through the virtual rubber spaces. And putting a drainage tube in the brain system, uh, usually we put a drainage tube in you prepontial pre system after operation to continue drain uh, cerebral fluid to uh, five to uh, seven days. Uh, this surgery can reduce secondary brain injury and uh, improve the uh, clinical progress of severe brain injury. The, this is a basal system drainage. Uh, every day we use drainage 150 and 200 million. Uh, so uh, after surgery, the ICP is uh, stable. So this is uh, because of this uh, basal system, uh, we can uh, avoid uh, avoid the soil or soil brain to open. So it's uh, it uh, can uh, reduce ICP uh, uh, effective. Uh, this is a brain trauma video. So we, uh, at first we cut the dura, uh, small, uh, use small cut, and, uh, uh, and then we 
uh, lift up uh, uh, float loop, then at this time we can see the chiasm, uh, chiasm system. Then open the chiasm system. Then this uh, uh, at this time uh, CSF come out. At the uh, at uh, this time when CSF come out, the ICP is uh, uh, reduced. Uh, after the uh, CF come out, at the uh, we uh, then open the uh, internal carotid system. At the, this time, uh, the ICP is uh, slowly slowly down. So we uh, the, when we open the inter, internal carotid system, then we uh, open the liquid member. At this time, more and more CS for FF you uh, come out. And at the at same time, we wash, uh, use uh, sunny wash. Uh, at the brandy CSF uh, come out. So after uh, we open the basal system at the CSF come out, the uh, brie uh, relax. Uh, at uh, this time, we can a lot of uh, CS, uh, bloody CSF come out. At this uh, is the Lily Christmas, uh, Lily Christmas map. Uh, we open the Lily Christmas and uh, uh, put the tube, put the drain tube in this uh, second space. And we put uh, the tube. We put the drain tube in second space. Uh, after put the tube, uh, we uh, drain it for five to seven days. And uh, this is a de depressive craniectomy. And uh, uh, we should uh, use second uh, uh, second surgery and uh, have uh, craniplasty. As a usually basic system, we can uh, we can uh, put the bow placed and uh, uh, avoid the second uh, surgery. Uh, why we do the basal system? Actually, uh, many years ago, uh, last century, uh, many professors uh, do cystostomy. Uh, so, uh, such as uh, free trauma, uh, annulin. At the at the free uh, infection, uh, so uh, but uh, why uh, we cannot uh, have the uh, many uh, reasonable uh, to uh, explain the basal system uh, because this century uh, new discovery of uh, CSF circulation micro neural anatomy uh, the new two thousand twelve. Uh, Michael Nedergaard present uh, the mechanism at the physiological importance of a perivascular CS flow. Uh, she description the glymphatic pathway. At uh, 2050, uh, to at the same time uh, have published two papers about uh, uh, dura lymphatic uh, lymphatic vessels. So in the model view of the circulation, include the CSF production in the crawl, 
cloud plexus at the extra cloud site flow of CSF from the electrical system and to the sub space. CSF flow into the glymphatic system, which is crucial for pre cleanliness at the homeostasis. And lastly, drainage of CSF at the pre extracellular fluid through dual uh, lymphatics, uh, perineural species, perisagital species at the acronoid granulations. Now, this is a timeline of uh, important discovery in pre fluid transport at the uh, 2000 uh, prime discovery in lymphatic system at the 2050 discover uh, dural lymphatic uh, uh, vessels. The lymphatic system and the manager uh, lymphatic vessels, they are uh, transport, uh, 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 blue, uh, blue fluid transport into four segment at the fluid transport pathway. One is uh, periantery CS influx. At the second is uh, aqua four sported influx at the dispersal of CSF in the uh, intracellular space. And uh, three segment is a perivenous influx at the managerial lymphatic vessels throughout the land of venous sinus at the export. Uh, this is uh, 2012 uh, for the, the lymphatic system. Uh, actually, this is a uh, uh, cyto architecture of a managerial prevascular at the pathway of a uh, perivascular recirculation. Uh, this is uh, perianthary channels are designed as part of a coax system. The outer primate, uh, primate of the channels is made up by extra glial outfit. Uh, actually, this uh, uh, lymphatic uh, divides three uh, function compartment. The first part uh, uh, is a uh, glymphatic influx occurs, occurs in the subacronal space where CSF enters, uh, CSF enters by bulk through into the periarterial artery spaces surrounding the arteries that are penetrating deep into the pre brachium. The uh, second part is the exchange of CSF and ISF occurs in the interstitial space of the pre brachium. The Movement of CSF into the prechema is uh, facilitated by aqua 4 water channel. At the third part of the gummy, fantic efflux consists of a drainage of interstitial fluid into the pervenous space, from which a neurotoxic and metabolic waste from ISF and reacts the CSF are transported directly out along managerial at the so we can lymphatic vessels and the lower cranial and the spinal nerves. This is uh, structured at the at the uh, uh, lymphatic system uh, structure. Uh, this is a uh, uh, lymphatic pathway in pre uh, metabolics. <clears throat> Uh, actually, in human brain also exists uh, the uh, glymphatic uh, pathway. Uh, this is uh, experimental study has also been confirmed in the human brain. Uh, this is a different time. Uh, the human brain's MRI, uh, different color uh, means different, uh, different times uh, lymphatic pathway. Uh, this is a 2050 uh, uh, for the, the managerial lymphatics. Uh, at the same time, these two patients, uh, these two papers uh, write about uh, uh, dual uh, lymphatic uh, vesicle system. This uh, is a uh, 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 movement of inter interstitial fluid to lymph, lymph diffuse. Uh, this is a uh, CSF uh, production 
uh, then to uh, pre exchange and to prevent us uh, influx and uh, uh, to lymphatic drainage. Uh, actually, manage lymphatic vessels at the school base during several uh, space, se se several uh, spinal fluid uh, because uh, characteristic uh, features of a basal uh, manager lymphatic vessels located close to the CSF are characterized, characterized by protruding blood and capillary lymphatic vessel branches and the lymphatic valves. The anatomic location of basal meningeal lymphatic adjust to the subacronal space makes them more likely than dorsal uh, uh, meningeal lymphatic vessels. Uh, CS run mainly through the basal lymphatic uh, outflow. Uh, meningeal in addition, the morphological features and the dis distinct anatomic location of a basal MLV suggests that they may be the main root of a CSF uptake and drainage. Uh, basal meningeal lymphatic vessels are located in close proximate to the subacronal space with a much seen dual layer and with only a loose intervene at the uh, acronoid part means that the basal um, LVs would be more likely than uh, uh, to facilitate CSF uptake at the transport. Uh, this is evidence uh, for three major anatomy pathway for clear CSF from cranial. Uh, when TBI redound in the managerial lymphatic drainage and the lymphatic function. Because the managerial lymphatic vascular is not associated with smooth mouth, it is especially vulnerable to changes in pressure at the base value inside the fixed skull. TBI results in comprised managerial lymphatic drainage at the increase in, in, in cranial pressure, which Commonly observed in TBI can impair, can impair in uh, manager lymphatic drainage and uh, affect the lymphatic function. Uh, if we prevent the rapid rise of ICP after TBI may provide a route uh, in which to address both the lymphatic and the lymphatic dysfunction that persists after pre trauma. Uh, because uh, the lymphatic system is responsible to transport ISF to the CSF uh, surrounding the brain. Uh, uh, Manager lymphatic may a uh, key drainage route for cerebral spinal fluid into the periphery blood. Uh, actually, uh, recent uh, research work demonstrated that uh, the feeding is uh, lymphatic is modulated by managerial lymphatic function suggests direct linkage between the two systems when fluid without any obvious anatomic connection. As a breeze uh, pulsatile organ, uh, so the passage of a pulsation through a break constitute a kind of the force circulation. Uh, this is uh, uh, Half a cushion name the circulation of the cerebral space, cerebral spinal fluid, the third circulation, in reference to the blood and the lymphatic circulation in the first and the second mass. Uh, this is blood and the uh, cerebral spinal volume changes in the brain during uh, cardiac cycle. Uh, this, this is a three dimensional computer module of a subject. With a, a specific cerebral fluid. Uh, the Pontai uh, sister it has volume, uh, has a volu volu uh, volumetric uh, flow rate uh, high. Uh, this uh, is a uh, uh, cerebral uh, fluid dynamic in human uh, cranial subacronal space. Uh, this is a computer model.
and uh, uh, this uh, is uh, different time uh, relative pressure relative, the pressure values are given with re respect to the cs outlet pressure uh, this is a uh, uh, velocity magnitude uh, uh, towards at a cross section of the perennial SAS at a select point in time with one cardiac cycle. Uh, this uh, is a uh, several Madonna assist at the point assist's uh, peak uh, velocity. Uh, actually, uh, CSF velocity in the Carina SS, uh, where cerebral Madonna assist peak velocity is reached uh, eight point three, and uh, uh, point assist uh, the chiasm sister in the beta assist uh, the highest velocity we uh, we up to five. Uh, Five centimeters. Uh, why we uh, do need in pre assist? Because uh, in hand injury, uh, injury due to brief swell, normal pathway of CSF circulation are usually closed. Therefore, the probability of uh, developing intracranial pressure gradient is much high. Uh, closed school TBI is uh, associated with elevated ICP at that can contribute to this eruption in meningeal lymphatic drainage function. So we prevent the rapid rise in ICP seen after TBI may provide a route in which to address both the lymphatic and the lymphatic dysfunction that persists after brain trauma. Because the highest velocities in the perineal SS, I see in the uh, prepontal uh, system and in the pedicle system and the chiasm system. Uh, at the CSF run mainly through the basal lymphatic outflow. Uh, so it is we uh, reasonable to treat CSF in prepontal system, which is then important to restore lymphatic function. So we have observed that uh, this approach will mobilize CSF from the uh, bulky brie, prechemia, and the perivascular species. Basically, brie uh, diuresis at the CSF shift. Uh, the rule of a basal system drainage, it can reduce intracranial pressure effectively. It can relieve the cerebral vessel uh, basin and can improve progress. It helps to reduce the incidence of uh, uh, traumatic hydrocephalus. It can relieve brain stem compression. It can replace ventricular puncture uh, drainage or repeat lumbar puncture drainage of bloody CSF. Uh, this uh, basal system in neurosurgery can use uh, brain trauma, cerebral hemorrhage, cerebral infarction at the severe aneurysm subacron uh, hemorrhage. This is uh, uh, some cases, uh, uh, this, uh, this is uh, this uh, not me for trauma-free herniation. Uh, we, after uh, surgery, the brain relax, the bow uh, flap replaced. This is a, a 57 male patient, brain trauma and uh, uh, right pupil dilation, uh, GCS is five. Pupil right is uh, six, left is 2.5. This is a CT scan, uh, right fraud temporal subdural hematoma. After basal cystosomy, we put a drainage uh, at the bow reflex. This is uh, after surgery uh, CT scan. Uh, this is only for hypertension, cerebral hemorrhage, herniation, uh, a 54 uh, male patient, uh, brain hemorrhage, and uh, uh, left pupil dilations. Uh, GCS is five. Uh, left um, pupils is uh, four millimeter. Uh, CT scan is uh, 
left the basal ganglion into into uh, cerebral hemorrhage at the broken into ventricle. Uh, after cystotomy at the clean the hemorrhage, we put uh, uh, the drainage in prepontine system at the bow reflex uh, bow replaced. Uh, so cystotomy represents a valuable option for treatment of a choice in neurocritical surgery. This surgery approach gaining apparent acceptance in many uh, centers worldwide. Uh, and uh, it applies this technique and report more outcomes. It could be proved to be a pros, pros mission surgery technique by itself or as a complement to the commercial craniectomy. Uh, this is uh, my friend, America uh, neurosurgery doctor. She he said, if you need a decompression after basal cystotomy, then the progress is poor. Uh, in my experience, most of the people uh, after cystotomy, the brain relax, uh, the bow can replace. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Wong, for a very elaborative presentation. And uh, you have actually covered a lot of uh, recent advances in the glymphatic pathway mechanisms. Um, it was good to hear your uh, summary of the recent advances. Uh, so the floor is open to questions. Uh, let me see whether there are any questions answers. No, there's nothing in the Q&A. Uh, may I have the comments from the other panelists? Dr. Liu? Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Prof. Uh, thanks, Professor Wang, for a very nice presentation. I have two questions, Professor. Uh, in your opinion, do you think that the effectiveness to drain the CSF uh, between cystinostomy and ventriculostomy, uh, is there any differences and why you think that uh, ventriculostomy should be replaced by cystinostomy? My second question is, you did mention about maintenance uh, MCA infarct. Uh, that uh, can be treated just by cystinostomy without uh, the compressive cranctomy or removing of the bone flap. May I know the result of your series, Professor? Thank you. Uh, actually, when when they open uh, when the surgery do surgery after uh, act first because uh, the ICP is high uh, usually uh, 40, uh, 50, uh, 50. So uh, when we use uh, uh, dural cut uh, small, small. Then uh, at first we let the uh, skull base, open the skull base. At, the, at this time, CSF come out at the uh, ICP is reduced at the uh, very relaxed. At the, uh, actually, especially brain trauma, uh, we, 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 uh, we, can, uh, we can reach the basal system uh, easily. So at this time, uh, sometimes uh, when you use uh, uh, ventricle drainage um, after surgery, the ventricle drainage is uh, uh, is blocked. So they, at this time, the uh, CSF cannot uh, come out. At this time, ICP is uh, not uh, reduced. So uh, at the uh, basal system, uh, the uh, drainage is uh, re re is. Uh, uh, fluid cannot blocked, so it's easy. It's easy and it's effectively uh, can reduce the CSF. Uh, usually, when the ICP is uh, sixty miller uh, meter mercury uh, below sixty, uh, after cystotomy, we can reduce the ICP effectively. At this time, after CSF come out. Uh, the ICP is uh, reduced, uh, the brain is re relaxed. At this time, bow, uh, we can replace the bow. Uh, actually, if uh, the ICP is to uh, surprise uh, uh, 60, uh, 60 millimeter mercury, um, after, at this time, the brain swallow. The brain is very swallow. At this time, the uh, bow cannot uh, replace. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Professor Sukru, will you like to comment? Yeah. Uh, yeah thank you for uh, giving us a detailed information also about the lymphatic system. Uh, I think there is still a long way to go 
and we don't know the real mechanisms of lymphatics of the brain. Uh, I think what you have tried to explain is that it's uh, not only important for the mechanical pressure, but for some chemicals or uh, for some, uh, let me say, vasopressors or all the other things go away, drained away with this is the technique. But what I would like to ask, if you go to the prepontine system and uh, you open the liquid membrane, do you also open the lamina terminalis system? Which is, uh, I mean, uh, lamina terminalis system is also very important. And sometimes, you know, in the old days, we also perform third ventriculostomy through opening the lamina terminalis. And it also gives us a lot of uh, CSF coming from the ventricles as well. That's my first question. Do you open the lamina terminalis system? And do you sometimes do third ventriculostomy from the classical way and from the conventional way? Second question is, um, after sparachnoid hemorrhages, some of my colleagues put lumbar drain and keep it for a few days to drain the CSF from the uh, blood. What's the difference in your cases? Is it more effective than the lumbar drain in just superarachnoid or aneurysm cases? I must not the trauma or other cases. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, the assembly and uh, it uh, should be uh, open the liliquism. Uh, uh, if we open liliquism member, uh, we can uh, let uh, the CS uh, uh, come out more. And, uh, 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 but uh, this is because uh, when we open liliquism member, we uh, we can open the school base effectively. And this uh, drainage uh, CSF is blunting. Uh, it's, uh, if we uh, open the laminar terminal, this is also a uh, drainage uh, uh, ventricle CSF. So these uh, two kinds of CSF are different. If we uh, drainage, drainage uh, blunting CSF, it's benefit the patient benefit uh, uh, progress. It's very important. Uh, this is a uh, uh, system blind CSF. It's different from vertical CSF. Uh, actually, uh, at the second question, uh, if we number system drainage uh, at, uh, uh, after acute uh, patient, uh, acute uh, uh, brain trauma, it's uh, dangerous sometimes. It can uh, you reduce uh, uh, lead to uh, herniation if uh, we left uh, more CSF come out. So I think basal system is uh, uh, safely drainage, safely drainage. They cannot, uh, uh, they cannot reduce uh, to uh, brain hemorrhage, uh, uh, brain uh, herniation. Yeah, I, my other question, I thank you. I, of course, we should be careful about the hematoma cases, but pure subarachnoid hemorrhage, and we clip the aneurysm. After the clipping the aneurysm, you know that there is no hematoma, no mass effect in the brain. Uh, I am asking, is it better than the uh, lumbar drain, the basal systems? But you, I think your answer is the same. I think because the bloody uh, CSF is more on the, in the systems. Am I right? Uh, actually, uh, when brain trauma, uh, brain aneurysm, the ventricle CSA is uh, clean. Uh, okay. uh, sister uh, CSF is uh, bloody. Okay. So this is a uh, uh, subacron the bloody. So we should. Uh, uh, drainage this uh, bloody CSF. And uh, uh, it can be uh, reduced uh, ICP at the uh, at, uh, banter for patient. Thank you.
Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sukru. So we have a lot of time left. So let me ask uh, questions one by one to Professor Wang. Uh, Professor Wang, you had actually beautifully commented upon the glymphatic pathway, but the animal studies does show that the glymphatic pathway abnormality starts on day three of trauma. And uh, henceforth, uh, the initial cisternal drainage, what we do, uh, may not be actually helping the glymphatic abnormality to, to, to return back even faster. It has to develop and it will develop a little later. And uh, also, there is a difference in the, uh, in the mechanism of edema, which causes edema, basically. Either it is a vesogenic edema or a cytotoxic edema that also has an effect upon uh, how the cisternal drainage is going to work. So do you have any comments to make on these findings and observations? Uh, actually, <clears throat> uh, before the many professors uh, do basal system, uh, for many years, but uh, uh, we, don't, we don't know why uh, this uh, surgery effective for uh, brain edema. Actually, when, uh, uh, because the lymphatic system and uh, manager, uh, many lymphatic vessels uh, found, we can uh, explain why this uh, surgery is uh, reasonable. Because uh, um, usually our CSF is uh, produced in ventricle, then come out in subarachnoid uh, at the into system, brain system, especially at the first into a uh, school based system. At the uh, at this time we uh, land uh, you especially brain trauma, uh, brain hemorrhage, the ICP is high. At this time. The glymphatic uh, system is uh, is destroyed. At the uh, glymphatic uh, uh, manager, uh, lymphatic vessels is also uh, uh, cannot uh, uh, cannot drainage to re, uh, uh, cannot drainage. So the ICP is more and more more and more high at this time. Uh, if we open the uh, basal seats as the CSF come out, at this time, uh, ICP is reduced. After several days, when the lymphatic uh, function recover, as the patient uh, will, uh, will put. And definitely, Professor Wang. So the, the comfort of looking at the brain, lax, and pulsatile after a system and drainage procedure is very, very comforting to the neurosurgeons. Uh, when we are operating on a patient. But then there's another finding also. When we are operating on a patient, so, uh, within first 48 hours of trauma, uh, we do have a lot of uh, CSF uh, trapped in the basal cistern and that can be easily released. But when the ICP rises after day two or day three, then during those peer patients, when we are operating, we do not find a lot of CSF in the cistern. Now, this does challenge us, the concept of lymphatic pathway. Uh, what is your observation on this? and experience on these findings? <clears throat> actually, if we, uh, uh, actually, c is a micro, micro new surgery, we should uh, uh, use microscopy at, uh, at the open the basal seat. At this time, actually, uh, uh, pre trauma patient has a lot of uh, uh, blunt CSF. So when open, when lift up uh, uh, front lobe, we can uh, expose a kind of system at the uh, carotid system. At the open this system, the CS will come out. Uh, when ICP is more than 60 uh, uh, millimeters mercury, at this time, the patient is very serious. The, this is, uh, such patient uh, can, uh, the, Progress, progress is poor. Mm -hmm. So uh, during the like uh, patient selection, uh, do you actually see the patient CT scan and uh, look for any prepontine uh, cisternal spaces? If in case they are seen, then uh, that patient becomes a good case of uh, cisternal drainage only. Uh, do you consider this and patient selection uh, criteria? Uh, <clears throat> actually, every patient uh, like pre trauma, we use. Uh, uh, pre operation, we use ICP monitor. Mm -hmm. At this time, if we have pre operation ICP, 
uh, we can use uh, uh, cystostomy. If the patient, uh, if the SAP is below 60, we can use uh, uh, basal seat uh, effectively, as uh, we can let, let the CSF come out at a very re relaxed. If the uh, pre-operation SAP is more than 60, so this is a, uh, this is uh, this is patient is very serious at the pre uh, uh, is especially uh, severe pre trauma. At this time, we can have not uh, use uh, we, we we have not this is not is not uh, effective. Okay, so you actually see the pre-operative ICP and then decide on the patient. And that's a very good uh, suggestion uh, which you have made, uh, definitely, Professor. Uh, besides this, uh, I have seen in the surgical video which you had presented, uh, uh, are you not uh, drilling the uh, anterior clonoid process uh, completely? Uh, because in the video, uh, the ACP was still in there. Uh, uh, so what's your take on that? Uh, actually, uh, the pre Operational ICP is very important uh, uh, because ICP can, uh, can, show, uh, can show us the patient uh, uh, severe uh, series. So uh, when ICP uh, is uh, can guide, guide us to do surgery, if the ICP is below 60, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, left uh, base, we can open the uh, basal system uh, effectively. Uh, we can use uh, uh, micro, uh, micro surgical uh, tools as a help power uh, open the basal system. Okay, Professor Wang. So, what uh, our experience had been that uh, ACP drilling is actually not required. Complete ACP drilling is not required. Uh, it is indicated only if, in case we have a, 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 a chiasma which is actually located a little bit more anterior, or also known as prefix chiasma. So, in that cases, we have to actually go to a complete ACP drill and open up all these spaces in the skull bases. Uh, but then, um, if in case uh, there's no prefix chiasma, we can actually go ahead with a simple uh, uh, drilling of the clinoid. Not complete is not required. And as you rightly showed in a video, it's a subfrontal approach, uh, which actually leads to the uh, keratico optical system. And, and from there, we can move ahead and uh, attack the lilipus membrane. Um, in, in our surgical experience, what we have found is that uh, uh, just not uh, cutting the lilipus membrane may be enough. Why? Because uh, there may be a lot of uh, arachnoid bands underneath, as well as the blood as such also um, uh, mixes up with these arachnoid bands and makes the visual visualization of the uh, internal structures a little bit difficult. So what we make as an endpoint is the, is the basilar artery. If the basilar artery is seen, if the PC is seen, then that means we have got to the end of the lilicose membrane dissection. And at that point, we put the um, EVD catheter inside. Uh, so that's how uh, we have a little bit modified. So the only modification, which I think is uh, predominantly important in the cases of traumatic injury, traumatic brain injury, is that not to move the temporal lobe. Uh, if you are handling the temporal lobe uh, in an uh, already edematous brain, then actually that calls for long. Well, uh, Professor Wang, you have been a uh, uh, lot, uh, lot. You have been very much informative about uh, this uh, procedure, and we have learned a lot from your experience. Uh, so, um, is there any other questions from the panelists? Well, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, indeed, it was a very wonderful session from Professor Yang Hong Huang. I would like to ask, what is this results in stroke? In patients with stroke, how are the results of cystinostomy? Professor Wong? Stroke? Yes. Stroke? stroke. Brain hemorrhage? Infantious stroke. No, no, no. Infarction, like ischemic stroke, huge uh, malignant middle cerebral artery infarct. Sorry? Af after middle cerebral artery infarction, what, what, what are the results of cystinostomy after ischemic stroke? No, no, stroke. You don't have any experience. Well, okay. uh, may I add here, uh, Dr. Yes, Rajiv? Sure, why not, actually... please? You actually raised a very valid point uh, because um, when this uh, cystonal stomach procedure was um, uh, suggested, 
uh, it was suggested uh, for various um, indication, including uh, this cerebral infarction. And there were many papers also from different uh, researchers. They have found good results. But then uh, my own personal take, and as well as what the recent evidences show, is that this cytotoxic edema is not something which can be uh, addressed by the glymphatic pathway abnormality or can be actually corrected or reversible. Henceforth, uh, even our experiences uh, with the cisternal drainage procedure for, in, for malignant cerebral tertiary infarction has not been that good. Uh, so we have to uh, undergo, uh, undertake this patient with a decompressive canectomy. And uh, my uh, approach for the uh, recent few uh, cases had been, or rather more so the cases after the initial audit which we done in our department had been that we do not do cisternostomy procedures for the middle cerebral tertiary infarction because it has not been shown to have that much of effect. Uh, it is better to add just a lumbar drainage if in case um, the decompensate anectomy fails to uh, give you a satisfactory result. Well, um, this question is still debatable and uh, there can be different opinion from our panelists. So we may have a discussion on this. Professor Liu, would you want to comment on this? Yeah, actually, I, I never tried that, but uh, I think the, the clear advantage of a draining cyst or doing a cystonostomy if there's a bloody cystonostomy. Otherwise, uh, probably like uh, what uh, Professor uh, Chaga has said, uh, opening the lamina terminalis is the best option where you drain all the cysts in all channels uh, within the brain. Uh, but more importantly, I think, again, uh, depend on timing. Uh, and, and if you do do it early, then you have less brain damage. Otherwise, it's very dangerous to do this strong for me in uh, malignant brain swelling. Uh, second, uh, secondly, is uh, we also need to uh, look at uh, the shift uh, because a prof did show us some uh, subdural. Uh, in my opinion, if the subdural thickness uh, are, are not so thick uh, compared to the midline shift, then probably we can do away uh, just by evacuate a clot and, and sometimes we are not sure whether the cystonostomy are really needed in those cases, especially the one he showed a large intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, we do kept come across a patient that after evacuation of clot, especially in elderly, uh, we doesn't really need to take out the bone uh, and, and only happen to those cases delay surgery. Uh, you will get the delay brain swelling, uh, whether you got, you're going to do a cystonostomy or not doing a cystonostomy. Uh, I, I remember last time uh, during my training, uh, we used to ask not to put EVD more than seven centimeter. Uh, with more than seven centimeter, uh, the likelihood for it to end up in pre pontine system are very high. And that is a, a crime uh, among a trainee. And now we know that draining a uh, pre pontine system is actually giving advantage. I'm not sure whether we should uh, uh, revise that, that, uh, that advice. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, uh, I, sh I should make this comment because uh, here on this platform, there may be many residents listening to this. Uh, um, the reason why we were, we were told not to go more than seven centimeters is that sometimes, uh, like most of the residents, when we were residents, we used to put the EVD with a stylet inside. So these are hard structures. We can uh, puncture through the vas vascular structures um, underneath the pre in in present inside the prefontaine cistern. So that was the reason uh, why it was not advised. Um, however, opening the lamina terminalis itself is uh, not without any problem. Uh, lamina terminalis is basically an extension of hypothalamus. And henceforth, uh, if in case uh, there is no dilated third ventricle, chances are that we may be, having, we may be causing some hypothalamic damage to these patients. Uh, so uh, adding a third ventriculostomy to every patient just to open up the, all these spaces inside may still be debatable and uh, may not give a good uh, uh, outcome to the patients. Well, uh, uh, Professor Sukhru may be having some comments on this. Uh, Professor. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I think uh, we are going to learn a lot uh, with the uh, series we should be careful about. Uh, what's going on around, uh, I mean, the lymphatic system is still, uh, I think, no man's land. <laughs> there are many <laughs> speculations, but it's not something concrete still. There should be many things discussed. And um, in the future, I hope uh, uh, there will be more answers to many questions. We're still trying to find something. You know, systems are really important. And uh, when Yeshagi first introduced microsurgery in, in the, uh, Europe, 
and they were criticizing him. This is a oriental fa fantasy. If you are trying to operate the brain through systems, that's an oriental fantasy. Now we, we all learned how important the systems. Systems became our somehow highways to go many sides of the brain. But what's going in the systems is an answered question. And as you mentioned before, systems uh, content of CSF is different from the other sides of the brain. The plexus around the veins or the dural sinuses is still, there are many mm, reports on them. We'll see and we'll go more molecular side of the brain, but stems is going to be our uh, still, uh, I think the most important pathway to many different pathologies. That's all I know at the moment. Thank you, thank you very much. We can conclude the webinar by the final comments from Professor Amit Thapa. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for a very uh, important discussion. And uh, we had a very comprehensive uh, presentation by Professor Wong. Thank you to him. He has actually summarized a lot of recent advances uh, in the lymphatic pathway research. And as Professor Sukru rightly put up, uh, still uh, the th things are not very clear, but uh, we have to innovate. We have to learn because this, uh, the, all everybody has the similar results and the outcome in the traumatic brain injury, stroke patients, for that matter, as it's still not completely satisfactory, and we have to have a lot of uh, question answered. Uh, so this innovation and research will keep on going. Uh, meanwhile, uh, our clinical inputs, as well as observations and analysis, is very important. So, Professor Wang, thank you very much for giving us a very lucid presentation on a particular topic, and thank you, Dr. Raja and Dr. Liu, for giving us this platform for uh, for discussion on this very important. A subject in neurosurgery. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Kondo, any comments from you? No, I think that it's a good time to, to sharing that this kind of like important information. And uh, as you may all know that, uh, you know, a lot of people, especially about the, the dementia or more, much more like a higher cerebral function is all focusing, also focusing on the, the lymphatic system too. So we we are struggling about the, the what exactly is happening to the, in, in, you know, you know, in, a, in our intracranial portion. So uh, it's a good time and it's like a good uh, it's a chance to, to sharing that there are uh, acknowledgement for that. So thank you for uh, giving me uh, that kind of like a great time for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's time we wind this up now. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers of today, Professor Shukru Shaglar and Professor Yong Hong Wong and the Chairs Professor Akhi De Kondo and Professor Amit Thapa for the time and support for the activities of the educational activities of the ACNS. It's very special thanks to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And as of now, we have 1,134 people who have joined us live. And a special thanks to my co-host, Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia for joining in today. So until we all meet on next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you.